Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where we've got three stories about three actors trying to do something new and interesting with their careers. Now first up is Mark Hamill. Talk about a blast from the past, but he's going to be very much a part of our future as he's hard at work filming Star Wars Episode 7. And there's been a lot of speculation about how, how big the roles will be for our original cast members. Of course, uh, Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, and Harrison Ford. Will they just come in and wave and say, we bless this movie? Or will they actually be part of the story? Now, according to a new rumor, Mark Hamill will, will very much be a part of the story, as this rumor says he's going to be the villain of the film, and perhaps even of the new trilogy. Now that would mean he's following in his uh, father's footsteps, uh, which would be interesting because the entire point of the first trilogy, in my mind largely, was that Luke Skywalker did not want to follow in his father's footsteps. But I guess you can't fight genetics. So whoever plays Luke Skywalker's kid in this uh, new trilogy, or even Princess Leia and Han Solo's kids, because uh, the Skywalker genetics are there too, they should be very concerned they will also go to the dark side. What an interesting uh, genetic uh, predisposition. Uh, you're more likely to go to the dark side. Do you have dark side in your family? If you're a Skywalker, you do. But I think that this might uh, come, this decision to make uh, Luke Skywalker the villain, besides I guess them being like, you didn't see that coming, did you? Ah, oh, damn rumors. Uh, but the other thing might be to capitalize on Mark Hamill's reputation as the Joker. Because let's face it, with the target demographic that Hollywood usually goes after, uh, which tends to be uh, on the younger side, they're going to know Mark Hamill primarily in that capacity as the voice of the Joker. Now, of course, Troy Baker has kind of taken that role, role over quite well, very impressively, but still, at the end of the day, Mark Hamill's the one who created this voice that Troy Baker very much models his own performance off of, uh, so Mark Hamill really is the, you know, the creator of this, this new Joker that's become so iconic and really most people's version of the Joker, much like Kevin Conroy, although too bad Kevin Conroy didn't come out of any Star Wars franchises. Uh, so I think that might be why uh, Disney and J.J. Abrams might have decided to do this and also give Mark Hamill a chance to do a live action villain since he was just so impressive and iconic uh, as an animated one. Now, I also wonder how people are going to feel, though, about having another Skywalker be the villain. Uh, is it too repetitive of Darth Vader? Would it be interesting to see maybe something else happen, an entirely new villain emerge? I think people are hoping for more of a fresh start here. I think because the prequels, you know, as all prequels are, they're so woven into the films that already exist because they have to be, because you, you know how things are largely going to end, because you know what happens next, you've seen those movies. But with sequels, you know, everything is a possibility. And so I think we're all kind of hoping to see the Star Wars mythology tread new ground. And I'm just curious if you think uh, another Skywalker, the son of Darth Vader, kind of taking over as the new Darth Vader, is, is that new ground. But it's, it's an interesting scenario. I'm very curious to see how Mark Hamill does with this. He's a very good actor, and he never really had a chance to show that off. Even in the first trilogy, the character just never really was that interesting. I'm sure there are some Luke Skywalker fans out there, but with the general public, it became very much the Han Solo Princess Leia show, the Obi-Wan show, the Darth Vader show, C-3PO um, and R2-D2. All of those characters, I think, are much more iconic and much more beloved than Luke Skywalker. So that might be another reason. They might be like, you know what? What are we going to do with Luke Skywalker? I know! Make him a villain. It worked for Cyclops! He's much cooler now. Alright, so that's the first story of the day. Now, the second actor trying to do something different with his career is, once again, Dwayne Johnson. He has so many lives in Hollywood, it's amazing. He started out kind of doing The Scorpion King, that was his first film, so trying to do those kind of like uh, Roman Sandal B pictures. Uh, then he moved into family comedies with The Game Plan, uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth 2, uh, very successful in that second one. Then he also became a big action star, kind of as I've said before, being steroids for uh, big action franchises like Fast and Furious, G.I. Joe. He came in there and pumped them up. Uh, but so far, he's had a little trouble carrying a movie on his own. Hercules didn't do very well. Uh, then, of course, Snitch, not very well before that. But it doesn't apparently stop Hollywood from continuing to hire him to lead, uh, lead up films, to head up films and play the lead role. He, of course, has San Andreas coming up. We'll see how he does there. Of course, it's a big disaster picture. Uh, that might help because the disaster is also a star of the film besides Dwayne Johnson. But he signed a very interesting deal uh, uh, just the other day, or is in talks for it, and that's to make a Baywatch movie. I think that is hilarious, and Dwayne Johnson could be a very good choice for that. As people are saying, he certainly has the abs for it. But what would a Baywatch movie be like? It couldn't possibly be serious, could it? And I think the answer obviously is no, because they've hired the screenwriters from We're the Millers to pen this. So to me, this screams 
22 Jump Street. That they're trying very hard to create another uh, tongue-in-cheek, let's laugh at ourselves version of a once popular but now somewhat still laughed at television show. Just like 21 Jump Street became uh, a comedy in the hands of Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum, it was very much a serious show uh, when Johnny Depp was the star of it uh, back, you know, I believe in the 80s. So I think this uh, 80s or 90s, I'm not sure, 80s, 90s, but still, you know, quite some time ago. And Baywatch, of course, is iconic. Everybody can recognize the Baywatch red swimsuit or trunks. Uh, and the Baywatch stars, of course, are very well known even today, largely David Hasselhoff and Pamela Anderson. Although, did you know Jason Momoa got his start on Baywatch, I believe? I was doing some research for him for his uh, upcoming role in the DC Cinematic Universe, and I was surprised to uh, see that little bit of information. Whenever you have these long-running big shows, there's always a number of actors who get their uh, start on them because they just they have such a, um, a variety, they need so many cast members to fill in all these episodes and guest spots. Uh, but I think that Dwayne Johnson, interesting choice. He's certainly very good at comedy. If you've ever seen him on Saturday Night Live, and so I think he's a he's a good choice. But I don't think he's as strong a choice as uh, Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum. They would need a Jonah Hill type character, I guess, to balance out the Channing Ta Ta uh, Channing Tatum character that Dwayne Johnson would be. Playing. I don't think he can do it on his own. And of course, Baywatch is always a team movie, though, so they're going to have to fill that out. And I wonder what female comedians they would bring on, uh, because, you know, you can go, uh, it's hard. I think that, you know, maybe Aubrey Plaza, she was very good playing a lifeguard in the to do list. But, you know, I think that you want to get people, women who can be as funny as everybody else, but obviously they have to fit the Baywatch image to some degree, or at least one or two of them do. You could have a couple of female characters and play with that. Uh, but I think this sounds promising. When you think of it in the vein of uh, 21 Jump Street, I think that this could work. All right, so that's the second story of the day. Now, the third story, of course, is one that broke uh, late just the other day, and I, I missed it on yesterday's morning movie news because it took a long time actually percolating to the top of the uh, entertainment uh, news soup, I guess you could say, and that be, might be because so many people in Hollywood are probably against this deal. And that's the news that Adam Sandler has signed an exclusive deal with Netflix to make four movies just for the streaming service uh, that will never play in theaters, which is interesting because he's had such a strong relationship with Sony for so long, they've distributed so many of his movies, but I guess he feels okay giving four to Netflix. Also, Sony might be like, hey, let's take a break because your movies aren't doing that, that well these days, which is another thing to consider as to why this might have actually happened. I think Adam Sandler probably can't get a lot of movie deals these days. Uh, he's blended, not a big performer. He has yet to have a really big hit. Uh, Grown Ups, uh, he made Grown Ups 2, Solid, but not as big as the first Grown Ups. And I think he's looking for a new phase in his career. And this is a great one. So he's going to make four movies that will be available to stream in 50 countries to Netflix customers. That is a huge distribution plan. And this, of course, comes on the news, uh, on the heels of the news that uh, Netflix is going to be doing the How to Train Your, I mean, uh, Crouching Tiger, <laughs> sorry, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon uh, sequel. They're going to be distributing that with IMAX. Now, they've already run into problems immediately, with, which I reported the other day, with Regal saying they will not distribute that in their IMAX theaters because they want to take a stand against this uh, you know, coming uh, threat from Netflix. And it's very much a threat, especially with this Adam Sandler deal. Now, Netflix isn't stupid. They picked Adam Sandler for a reason. Now, you might be saying, why would you pick Adam Sandler if his movies don't perform at the box office? But Netflix looked at their algorithm. They looked at uh, what people are streaming, just the way they kind of recommend movies for you. And they saw that a number of people uh, are streaming Adam Sandler films. They're very popular day in, day out. It's kind of like the logic that went behind the recent announcement of making a Mrs. Doubtfire 2, because it's so popular still to this day with people watching it on demand, etc. So they know there's still an audience for it. Now, of course, some people might say, hey, Netflix, your algorithms aren't so hot, because you never recommend movies that I want to watch. That's my constant problem on Netflix. I know a lot of people feel that way, and The Onion has made some very funny news bits about it. Uh, my favorite being Netflix's new service, which is just browsing. So you can have the same night of us uh, browsing for hours and never finding anything and yelling at all your friends because you end up not watching a movie. So I thought that was hilarious because it's so true. So hopefully their algorithm for deciding what movies to make is a little bit better and fine-tuned than deciding what movies to recommend to us. But I think that, you know, I would stream an Adam Sandler movie. I think he's a pretty consistent performer. I think like Tyler Perry, he's kind of devolved a little bit into TV territory, maybe not trying as much, although his movies were never particularly cinematic, but I think they were had a little more bite to them. They had a little bit better structure. They weren't so lazy. They weren't always using the same people. Uh, they, of course, they were favorites, but he mixed it up a little bit more than he is now. And Tyler Perry's also going to television. He's taking a break from movies. So I think this is a great choice for Adam Sandler. We'll see how it turns out for... Um, 
uh, Netflix. But uh, people are talking about this. Maybe it's happening. Maybe it's beginning to happen, just like it happened with uh, music. And then books are movies next. Um, is digital um, the digital convenience of being able to watch these things wherever you would like going to kill the movie theater? Will we be like, remember when there were record stores? Remember when there were bookstores? Remember when there were movie theaters? It's a very interesting thought. And I'm curious to where you would prefer to watch a movie. Uh, I'm having so many problems, as you know, I talk about here all the time about the quality of the experience in terms of cleanliness and rude other uh, you know, audience members talking or being on their phone, that I'm at the point where I would be very curious to see if it's viable to release these movies uh, on demand. Or, you know, uh, maybe a, a new class of movie theater will emerge, which has a, a very high price point to kind of ensure that better movie going experience. But very frustrating. I wish everyone was like Alamo Draft House, where they had security guards who will throw people out who are disrespectful of other patrons in the theater. Maybe everyone will have to go that route if they want to keep people coming to the theater if they now have the choice to watch it at home. All right, so those are the three stories of the day. Now, the viewer question comes from Matthew uh, Goncalves. I'm sorry, Matthew. I'm very bad at pronunciation, as everybody here knows. Or Mateus. And Mateus, though, has been very patient with this question. Another really patient uh, BTC viewer. And so I wanted to finally answer it today. So Mateus says, question. Hey, Grace. How's it going? It's going good. It's Friday. Uh, how come Marvel, so his question is, how come Marvel movies don't have the Disney logo, you know, the castle, uh, the very beautiful castle. Every time I see it, I'm like, I want to be there. I'm a big Disney World fan. Uh, and says, uh, attached to them like Pixar, Studio uh, Ghibli, etc. By now, everyone knows that Disney has bought Marvel, so there is no need to hide it. Is Marvel ashamed or embarrassed for having a kid's brand attached to their work or what? Keep up the great work, Mateus. Great question, Mateus, and I saw a few other BTT viewers were like, yeah, answer this one. So today I'm giving my answer. And I think the reason isn't embarrassment or uh, being ashamed of their la label, but I think it's not wanting to, to seem like they're everywhere, even though they are. I think Disney would like to create the illusion that you're watching different forms of entertainment. I think they worry that if people see the Disney logo too much, they might be like, uh, I've seen too many Disney movies. And I don't think you're probably going to see it in front of Star Wars either. You'll probably just see the Lucasfilm logo. And of course, these are Disney divisions. They own them. Uh, just like, uh, you know, you see the Marvel Studios logo in front of their pictures. So that's why I think that they're not doing it. Now, there might be some element of, hey, everyone might feel, well, this is a kid's movie. I don't want to have uh, a, a kid's logo in front of a Marvel film because we rely so heavily on, you know, adult moviegoers. But do they? I think the kids are a big part of the success of the Marvel movies because they appeal to everyone. And I I think they do a really good job reimagining the Disney logo for different properties. Tron, a Legacy, it was very cool. They've put it in front of uh, different movies, although maybe that's what's to blame with the lack of success for Tron Legacy. No, nope, it was that, that it was a crappy movie. But, you know, who knows what the Disney suits are thinking over there. I enjoy seeing the Disney logo, but I think that if you saw it in front of every movie, uh, which would probably be the case if they ran it in front of all their pictures, uh, or almost every movie, you would get tired of it. It would lose that special quality. So I think they're right to manage their brands. Uh, and I would even say that maybe with Pixar, they don't need to put the Disney logo on that either. I think Disney, the Disney logo should appear on Disney pictures and everywhere else. They should try and do a good job, of, you know, building up the brands that they've purchased. Marvel, Lucasfilm, and of course, Pixar. So that's, that's my answer to your question. I hope it was helpful. Thank you so much, Mateus, for asking and for your patience. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories, the viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching.